The Master System comes with some of the best and brightest visuals from the 8-bit generation, and I was blown away when I first laid my eyes on some of the Disney games. Compared to other platformers on the console, they looked so much more lively and colourful, but the ones that were a clear cut above the best had Donald Duck as the main character. There are two games in particular that caught my attention to talk about, but we'll get to Deep Duck Trouble another time. The Lucky Dime Caper opens up with most of your favourite cartoon ducks having a conversation about money and the meaning of hard work. Scrooge is attempting to impart some good life philosophies on Huey, Dewey and Louie and hands them each a dime after sharing that his own fortune started with one of his very own. Unfortunately for them, while they've been talking, someone's been lurking outside the windows and spying on their conversation about vast fortunes, and before too long, the boys are plucked straight out of their family's care. The kidnappers are some raving goons working for the devious Magicka Dispel, who also pops in to taunt Scrooge and Donald before disappearing with the lucky dime. It's up to Donald to save his nephews and get one of Scrooge's most prized possessions back. The manual does a great job of outlining the plot, but the real winners for best delivery are the introductory cutscenes. The sprites are extremely expressive and move through their motions beautifully against a coherent script. Throughout the game, as you take down each stage, there are additional story moments to look forward to, adding a lot of depth to what's really just a straight platforming game otherwise. The care and detail of these scenes is also extended to the rest of the game's graphics, and as I mentioned earlier, the visual experience in the Lucky Dime Caper is pretty much bar none for the Master System. I tried very hard to spot anything at all that looked plain or might be difficult to interpret, but there's not a single bunch of pixels here that aren't nice to look at. Even the most mundane things like bricks and spikes have texture or shading on them, making each environment feel a little more alive than your average adventure. The only semi-ugly thing is the map screen, and that's not only because of the bland colour palette. The representation of the world was questionable. Africa's now a floating island, Italy's a gangly appendage hanging off of the bottom of Europe, and Antarctica looks like it's just a hop away off of the southern tip of South America. I've seen some weird depictions of our very own Earth in video games, but this one seems like it didn't really try very hard at all. Donald's antics are one of the standouts here, and his animations are my favourite part of this whole adventure. He has a variety of movements and gestures depending on whether he's too hot or cold, or when he steams with rage when you get a game over. His spunky little walk cycle makes him one of the more engaging protagonists to play from this console generation, and the sprite work looks like something more suited to the Super Nintendo or even the Sega Genesis rather than the Master System. They clearly put a lot of effort into making Donald feel multidimensional, which in turn helped to realize a very polished experience. The music was also fantastic from start to finish. I'm usually pretty hard pressed to find exceptionally great music on the Master System, but nearly every single track here was great. I especially loved the music from the Andes Mountains and Magicka's Castle. The latter has a little melody that should be on repeat in an old western movie while someone's riding a horse or something. The entire auditory experience propels all of the whimsy and joy that the visuals supply to new heights. As you search for the boys in the stolen dimes, you'll be jumping your way through many different places around the world. All of your favourite generic video game locations are here, like forests, tropical islands, and of course we can't forget Egyptian pyramids which seem to make it into pretty much every game ever. The level design is extremely immersive, since you don't only get to walk against a passive snowy backdrop or down some pyramid hallways solely to take in the sights. Lots of the features in these areas double as obstacles that spring to life and attempt to destroy you alongside of the many enemies that hang out there. I thought that this was a really creative way to do the typical around the world adventure with a little extra pizzazz mixed in. Some of my favourite parts were auto-scrolling down the side of Plaid Mountain while hopping boulders or dodging bubbling expulsions of lava from statues in the ancient runes area. This made for many surprising twists and turns in the gameplay to keep you on your toes and prevent things from getting stale. There are both horizontal and vertical sections to overcome, but for the most part the controls feel tight and responsive. This is great because there are quite a few instances where you need to be precise or reactive unless of course you enjoy dying. A little practice went a long way to land some of the harder maneuvers. This is far from a game that you'll coast through on beginner's luck, and much of it requires some trial and error to parse out and perfect. On one hand, you have a nice small sprite and are zoomed out enough to see what's coming at you from all directions, but on the other, enemies and obstacles will not hesitate to get right up in your face if you move forward too quickly. Even if you put your best effort forward, sometimes learning is still not enough. There are a few spots that lock you in and force you to wait before you can move on, and these initially seem to have some kind of pattern to them. Unfortunately, just when you think you've got it all worked out, it'll change up to mercilessly roast you. 
I couldn't figure out why these sections would suddenly mix up their order, but I suppose it's forgivable since the length of the Lucky Dime caper is fairly short. It's not surprising that some degree of memory work and strife would be necessary, or else you'd be able to beat this game in 20 minutes without much trouble at all. When it comes to throwing down, Donald's up against the usual local people and creatures armed with either a short-ranged hammer or a long-ranged frisbee. The frisbee's completely overpowered compared to the hammer, with its benefits of distance and being able to shoot in an upward direction. You'd be surprised at how many foes lurk just above you out of reach, and the frisbee is key to evening out that playing field. You can also jump on enemies to destroy them, but putting a bit of distance between you and what you're fighting is usually a better strategy unless you have no choice. Some of them have virtually no vulnerability window like these statues that spew fire everywhere, making it really hard to kill them without the frisbee. There's also something very sneaky about the fighting in general, because many enemies seem to have a couple of different patterns that are impossible to anticipate. They might jump over you one time, but the next they'll plow straight into you instead. There's no tell for when they'll change it up either, making every encounter an intense mystery until the last second when you're forced to respond in an instant. The first time through a level, it'll come down to inching your way along, spawning an enemy, and then trying to remember all of the variables that they might throw your way. There's no convenience like a palette swap to clue you in either, but like everything else, practice and a little bit of luck make perfect. The boss fights are either ridiculously easy or extremely difficult, with very little falling in between. On the easy end, many of these encounters have very predictable patterns with little variation, but not so much that you'll be tied up with them for too long. The fights that are a lot more troublesome usually involve an overhead boss that doesn't come down to your level very often. When you take damage in this game, you lose the ability to use your weapon, and if you get hit a second time without one, you die. So if you're approaching a boss fight from a checkpoint and get hit on the way there, it's considerably harder to beat them. This Snake Charming Raven boss, for example, has a hitbox that I just don't completely understand. I'd be jumping at the raven and land on it at the very peak of my jump and get hit instead of hurting it, or sometimes I'd take damage from the snake's fire when I was visibly out of its range. Across multiple attempts on several playthroughs, I couldn't seem to overcome these issues and eventually just had to rely on getting good. I had to make it all the way to this brawl with a weapon in hand and fully equipped to dole out frisbee bludgeonings to these jerks. It's certainly not the worst hit detection that I've seen in a platforming game, but it's definitely far from the best. On the topic of weirdness that doesn't make sense, my first time through this game, I almost gave up on it completely because I ran into what appeared to be some kind of hard lock. While I was working on a later stage, as soon as I got up to this one area with a bunch of ghosts flying around, one of them swooped down and touched me. I ended up frozen in place and couldn't move again. The worst part was that even though everything else in the stage kept moving normally, the timer in the bottom corner disappeared and consequently stopped ticking down, leaving resetting as the only option. I played through again that same afternoon and had the exact same thing happen, but when I came back to it about a week later, the issue was non-existent. That level in particular seemed very glitchy in a few spots where platforms would despawn or some of the graphics would teleport to places on the screen where they shouldn't be. I don't know if I'll ever be able to replicate this again, but it was very disheartening in the moment since the Lucky Dime Caper has no way to resume your progress if you turn off the console. There's no save or password system, and even though it doesn't take very long to get back to where you were, it would have been better if these problems had been worked out prior to its release. The Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck is an extremely endearing little game. Even with a couple of irksome aspects like hard to predict enemies and a fair number of glitches, the complete audio-visual package and some above average character control really shine brightly. Unfortunately, there's really not much in terms of replay value unless you consider changing up level order a perk, but it's certainly a game that can be enjoyed more the better you get at it. This is not only a must-play for Disney fans, but also for anyone that enjoys some solid platforming action, just as long as you of course don't mind an occasional unavoidable rock to the head during screen transitions. 